Hi, everyone. It looks like it's one o'clock. I hope everyone enjoyed the lunch, the lunch break. Um, I want to go ahead and get started. There's a, a packed uh, agenda for the afternoon. Um, this portion of the conference will be focused on the, um, the ACT Network, um, and they'll be covering a number of different topics. So at this time, I'm going to uh, pass this over to Elena Sandro, who is uh, going to be explaining the, the day um, and taking it from here. Elena? Excellent, Diane. Thank you so much this afternoon. Very excited to have all of you with us today. The agenda for this afternoon is split up into four different sessions with the start of each session at the top of each hour. So we will be diligent in keeping this on time and, and moving through. We have a lot of great content to get through. If you need to reference the agenda, it is on the event website. Uh, so you can, you can see the sessions there. Um, as Diane said, my name is Elena Sandro. I am the National Project Manager for the ACT Network, and I work for an organization called the Chartist Group, and I'm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I am just delighted to be working with a very talented team, not just within ACT Central, but with all of you and as ACT sites. And for those of you who are brand new to the network, maybe hearing about it for the first time just during yesterday's sessions or uh, are here learning more, we're really happy to have you, so welcome. I'm going to turn this over to Doug McFadden to kick us off with our first session. That's an introduction to the ACT Network and um, a little bit about our, our COVID work that we've been doing in our test network. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, I'm glad to be introducing the ACT afternoon session. Uh, we've had these at the ITB2 Transmark conferences in the past. Um, primarily it's been a session for people who are already engaged in ACT to um, ask you know, more questions, learn a little bit more about our roadmap and so on. Um, this session will include some basic introductory information. So if you're not familiar with ACT, um, this session um, should help you. So this is, uh, session is derived uh, significantly from our AMIA webinar several weeks ago, and you've seen little tidbits of it um, in the uh, prior sessions in I2B2 trans this I2B2 Transmark conference. Um, so uh, let me get going. Um, all right, so um, these are the people who will be speaking today. Um, I'm going to start out. Um, Sham will follow up uh, talking about uh, specific elements of the ontology work, and Sean uh, will follow up after that, looking a little bit more into the, the querying and you know things you can actually you know do with the network that are um, meaningful. Uh, Lee Nadler, who is the principal investigator for Harvard Catalyst, the Harvard CTSA, um, is unable to join us today, although he might pop in later this afternoon. So I'm leaving him up here. Um, so uh, in this session, uh, I'm going to give a, a sort of an act overview uh, for people that are either unfamiliar or have only heard little tidbits from the earlier sessions. And then the rest of it will be about our COVID-19 response. Again, some of this was already discussed earlier, but there'll be a lot more detail here. So um, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, all right, so let's move through here. So quick little reminder, um, ACT is funded by NCATS. Um, and uh, it was the name, of course, is accrual to clinical trial. So it was originally envisioned for cohort discovery, uh, study feasibility, and identifying sites that have uh, significant numbers of patients that could contribute to a, a clinical trial cohort. Um, of course, it's also um, you're able to do queries on the network that um, are more in the sort of the fundamental research category, um, and that is one of the areas that we're uh, we've expanded upon both with the COVID-19 focus and, um, and, and also looking to do that more in general. Um, regarding the original sort of goal of cohort discovery, um, re we recognize that you can't do everything through a federated network. So there, um, there were ITB2 plugins developed to um, help once you've identified a site where there might be a patient cohort you're interested in for that site to manage uh, uh, create a, a list of those patients and help manage screening them. Uh, so 
yeah, and of course this, you know, since it includes all EMR data and uh, over 130 million lives and it has a consistent ontology and so on, it supports a broad range of clinical and translational research. And um, our network is actnetwork.us. I don't know if you need the slash national, but it doesn't hurt. Um, and that's the front page of our uh, website for uh, the ACT Network. Uh, what you don't see is further down on the page, there's a, a I don't know, probably dozens of uh, resources made available, uh, both explaining the network, how to use it, and so on. So it's a, it's a really good way to become more familiar about the ACT Network. Um, so just a little bit of information uh, regarding sort of how the ACT team is constructed. Um, there, um, there's a PI group at the top of our pyramid. Uh, oops, didn't mean to click it. Um, and it's actually a group. We have a, a primary PI, Steve Reese, but then we have three other PIs, Lee Nadler, um, Bob Toto, and Gary Firestein. And uh, they act as a you know, sort of strategic direction and keeping an eye and making sure everything's on track. Um, there's an executive committee, which uh, includes the PI group um, and members from all the working groups, which we'll see a little bit more later. Um, and you know, special guests from time to time, and I think our NCATS representative also. And then there's working groups and the operations group and so on that where a lot of the meat of the work happens. And then finally, of course, the biggest part of this whole pyramid is the engagement from all of the ACT sites, the CTSAs, um, referred to as hubs, uh, and their level of sort of commitment to making this all work. Um, and as you can see, there's, you know, obviously this is sort of a two-way street. We get direction and, uh, you know, sort of a strategic goals. Uh, a lot of it comes from the PI group and the executive committee, but also a lot comes back up from uh, activity on the ground, sort of, uh, you know, in the, a little bit in the weeds um, that helps also sort of drive uh, what we do. Um, so um, this is just a sort of a different representation showing you the working groups. We have uh, five uh, working groups, governance, uh, regulatory, technology, data harmonization, and dissemination evaluation. Um, we're, we've heard a, a lot and we'll continue to hear a lot about the technology and data harmonization activities here, um, but the other elements are obviously critically important. Um, and uh, there'll be, I think, opportunities within the overall ACT uh, regular webinars to learn a little bit more about those. So here's a slide I think people have seen numerous times for ACT. Um, it highlights the um, CTSAs that are in the network, the ones that are joining the network. And um, at this point in time, we have almost every CTSA in some stage of being live or on the way. Uh, with 130 million unique patients, you know, roughly a third of the U.S. population is represented in this network. Um, federated, so it is a federated query network. A lot of discussion about this already, about what federated networks can do and what they can't. Um, uh, these are just basics for um, our federated network. Um, all data is drawn from the EMR and brought into a local data warehouse at each uh, institution. The data stays local within that I2B2. Uh, the Shrine network allows queries to flow to all sites. Um, all sites respond, and we've uh, spent quite a bit of effort recently in the Shrine area to uh, improve the responsiveness of the network, um, both obviously working with sites about you know, potential um, uh, processing delays, but also with the way the Shrine network actually reports the query results. and um, so we, we now get results uh, frequently to a query within seconds, and most queries take not more than a minute or two. Obviously, you can phrase a query that's very complex and can take longer. Um, sometimes it even goes into a delayed for later queue, and so you can come back um, and check that query out later if um, it, it's in that uh, situation. Of course, all the results are aggregate counts, um, and uh, the, the, the design here is that um, the network is open to all researchers at participating sites and they can use um, their you know, software running off of their desktop or actually uh, running off of institutional servers 
to um, access the network and submit their queries. Uh, so the real-time nature and the uh, straight from a user's desktop, um, I think are uh, features that we really spend a lot of time looking at um, and trying to make as easy as possible. All right, so um, this slide is just um, sort of a more detailed version of what does it mean to be a federated query network. Um, the EMR feeds data to the research data warehouse. The Shrine adapter um, connects a site with the, uh, the hub, the Act Shrine hub, which in this case uh, represents um, a whole network, say our production network. And of course the Act Ontology and the Shrine web client are also um, important elements of making all those pieces work. Uh, worth noting, later today you're gonna see um, what we produced uh, with the new Shrine Web Client intended for novice users. We're really excited about this. Um, and um, it is, you know, um, uh, in the, I think the two to three session, um, we go into some length about this. So um, take a look at that if you can. Um, all right. So uh, one of our goals in putting together the ACK network was because we wanted this to be used by end users from their desktop um, and they're uh, frequently being able to execute queries in real time, we wanted to create a production network that um, was very robust as far as um, uptime and performance. Um, in order to do that, we offloaded two activities from our production network into other networks. Uh, our stage network is where new sites go to um, essentially start connecting to ACT and, um, and to uh, um, basically get their installation ready for production. Um, there's no end user access to this and this is really just a staging environment to make sure that things are working well before we put sites in production. We also have a test network. This is a bit more about testing new versions of I2B2, Shrine, ontologies, etc. cetera. Um, to uh, make sure that they work well before we promote them to production. Um, and as you can see, um, there are sort of different expectations from sites um, as they're, they participate in these different networks, in particular the test network. Uh, we're really looking for um, institutions that are able and willing to essentially get be engaged in these sort of iterative testing processes take new versions of software, take new versions of the ontology um, in order to uh, test them and you know, uh, finalize them before they go to production. Um, and of course, in the production environment, um, we have uh, a 24 seven operations approach that um, uh, complements the work being done at each site um, and all the work that they do with ETL um, and their own local uh, assistance performance and monitoring. And worth noting, the uh, Honest Broker, what we refer to as the data steward, is um, part of each site's implementation. So each site is responsible for its own users. So um, over time, uh, as you can see, the number of uh, queries on the network have increased. Um, this is in part, uh, probably largely due to the fact that um, we have added more sites over time. We're continuing to add sites. And um, we're um, also sort of making refinements to many of the components, the ontology um, and shrine that are, I think, uh, make it easier for people to do their work. Um, so the major developments in the last year, last year, if you were with this in, in this session, you would have we, you would have been involved in a, a fairly lengthy discussion of the new interface that we've developed. At the time we hadn't developed it, we were looking for a lot of feedback and thank you everyone for the feedback last year and throughout the year as we've asked people to um, give us some guidance about what they think um, the, a new user interface, the challenges it needs to address and, um, and also when we demoed some features uh, giving us feedback on that. Um, and of course, as everyone has who's been involved in this conference knows COVID-19 showed up uh, a few months ago and uh, we have refocused a lot of our efforts on that um, over the last few months to really um, uh, see how the OCT network could be uh, ideally responsive to this. And a majority of the rest of this presentation will be about um, those actions. 
Um, I'm going to just give a little high level overview of um, sort of how the response has happened within the ACT network. And then I'm going to hand it off to Sham, who heads up our data harmonization uh, working group, and uh, Sean, who probably needs no introduction for everyone here, um, you know, also a key uh, co-lead for our uh, informatics technology group. Um, but before we do that, I'll just give you a quick high-level overview. Uh, one of our key elements here was, you know, we looked at the at network and sort of said, what can the, you know, what that we've already implemented could be used to um, address sort of the COVID-19 pandemic and questions. Um, and uh, what we found, of course, is that we had a good, uh, for, a good working model with um, ACT Network sites, we, you know, with our governance agreements and network agreements and our CTSA relationships and all the infrastructure we'd implemented. We had a lot to begin with for the COVID-19 work. Um, and so um, we started from there um, and this resulted in, uh, I think everybody has, you know, done some rapid work here, but uh, we also sort of rapidly addressed this. It was not a, a particularly high informatics uh, or infrastructure cost. All right, where did I lose my slide to? Uh, there we go. And, um, and there wasn't a big learning curve for a lot of the people involved. Um, so what do we do? Um, so in March, we you know, reformulated our team to expressly look at COVID-19. We were recruiting so, uh, sites to join our COVID-19 network, um, which is um, essentially just a, a, very, a, a reuse of our test network. Um, we wanted to be able to evaluate ontologies and, and our re data refresh loading rates and things like that in an environment that wouldn't affect production. So we repurposed our test network for this work. Uh, obviously, ontology work that Sean is going to talk about, data quality work and data validation work. Um, we um, essentially enabled this network to be used by a small group of researchers who could both do validation and provide some feedback. And we have a release plan rollout for this summer. Um, hopefully, I'm not surprising anybody in the ACT network to say that that release plan actually starts on Monday. Um, and uh, I think we'll go a little bit more into the steps that we expect to have happen there. So this is a snapshot of the test network that we use to evaluate um, some of the changes that we uh, put in place for COVID-19. Um, you can see that um, there are um, see nine sites in this network. They all have refresh rates that are um, very rapid. Um, I think the minimum or least frequent rate is a twice per week, and others have it down to daily. This was really helpful, especially in the early days of COVID-19, to see what was going on, uh, you know, in a much more real-time fashion. Um, this network had a total of 30 million lives in it, of which 240,000 uh, patients have been tested for COVID-19, and 24,000 have tested positive for COVID-19. We didn't pick these sites because they were hotspots. Um, these sites were more uh, uh, joined the network simply because they were willing to participate in all of the iterative process of testing things um, and put all the attention into that. Um, all right, so I am uh, uh, just about to hand the ball off to Sham, the head of our data, um, on, uh, data harmonization working group. Um, but I'd just like to carry forward on that one comment about the summer release plans. Um, the, our primary focus in those release plans is to get the new ontology out, which um, enables uh, queries on um, new terms that have evolved uh, for COVID-19 and some of our derived terms that aggregate local codes um, and things of that sort. Um, and that's really the big focus of the start of this release plan. All, all of the components of ACT are part of this release plan, but um, getting the new ontology out first um, and getting it um, installed at sites and uh, modifications to the ETL to support that. Um, and uh, also uh, looking at processes to increase data refresh rates is our first priority. We'll also be doing a new I2B2 re release to the network and a new Shrine release to the network with a new web client as part of this process, but that'll be a little bit later. All right, I think we're ready to switch over to Sham. Uh, okay, can, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, so, Doug, are you going to be 
uh, advancing the slides? Yeah, I'll be in the slide. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so this is Sham, Sham Visveshwaran from Pittsburgh, um, and I'll talk about the work that we have done in uh, formulating the COVID ontology for the ACT network. And uh, we have already gone through three revisions of this ontology. We are currently on version three. So briefly, I will talk about the ontology and a couple of uh, interesting features about the specific ontology, uh, which includes the derived terms. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the challenge with this new ontology is that uh, we want to deploy this ontology with, uh, well, let, uh, before I uh, talk about the ontology, uh, let me talk a little bit about the COVID-19 uh, phenotype. And uh, so this uh, phenotype was set up uh, basically for sites uh, which have a challenge in refreshing the I2B2 data marts very frequently. So if your data mart is somewhat on the smaller side, you can probably do a full refresh for the entire cohort. Uh, but if your data mart is pretty big, um, it may be quite challenging to do these frequent refreshes. So we came up with a phenotype that defines the cohort, which is of interest in COVID-19 research. And so if you have a large data mart, uh, you could just focus on only this cohort and refresh that in the I2B2. And so this uh, phenotype is based on uh, ICD-10 codes, CPT codes, and loin codes, uh, which are specific to COVID-19. And uh, uh, we have been iteratively expanding this as new codes come online. And also these are kept in sync with other um, big initiatives, like for example, PicoNet. And, uh, there's a GitHub repo which defines this. Uh, next slide, please. So this just basically lists uh, the various uh, codes that we use to define the phenotype. Um, so there are three ICD-10 uh, phenotype of codes and a whole bunch of loin codes. So the ontology itself, uh, we're currently in version three. The next version is in development um, and it's refined constantly based on the new codes which appear as well as the emerging needs. And uh, this, uh, the GitHub repo uh, gives the current set of codes that are included in the ontology. So specifically, um, I would like to point out three kinds of uh, elements or codes that we include in the ontology. Uh, one is the emerging codes, which are specific to COVID-19. Uh, this includes ICD-10 and CPT, HICPEX, and especially LOIN codes, which uh, LOIN releases almost on a weekly basis, uh, new codes uh, with reference to um, COVID labs. Uh, we also include in the ontology existing codes, which are already exist in other parts of the ACT ontology, and these are pulled in uh, so that it's easier for um, defining COVID-related queries. And then the third uh, um, component are the derived terms. And these are of particular interest in COVID-19 research. And I'll show you some examples of these. Uh, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> uh, so when you log into the, the ACT, COVID test network. Uh, so this is what you see um, in the Shrine interface. So the very top one is the COVID-19 ontology and below that are the standard ACT ontologies. So you have access to the entire ACT ontology in addition to the COVID-19 ontology. Next slide, please. Uh, so this just drills down a little bit more into the COVID-19 ontology. Uh, we have four sets of uh, concepts, uh, which include course of illness, uh, diagnostic related codes, uh, laboratory testing, and some uh, therapeutic uh, treatment codes. Uh, next slide, please. 
So of particular interest is the diagnostic lab codes. And uh, this is where the ontology keeps evolving pretty rapidly as uh, new loan codes uh, come into existence. And so what we do is uh, we collect all these uh, emerging loan codes uh, on a periodic basis and we arrange them, which you can see at the bottom, um, into uh, basically uh, based on the specimen type, whether it's coming from the nasopharynx, the respiratory specimen from the serum, et cetera. And then on the top, you can see that uh, we have included uh, specifically these derived concepts, uh, which uh, harmonize uh, all values from these labs into these eight possible values. So these are basically split up into two groups. Um, one group refers to the antibody labs and the other group refers to the nucleic acid or the antigen labs. And so the idea here is that uh, we want to harmonize all the values out of these labs to these four values um, and specifically the positive and the negative values. And this makes it quite simple uh, for a user to query on, say, for example, positive labs or negative labs, which uh, almost any COVID-related query would probably include. Next slide, please. Um, a second uh, part of the ontology uh, looks at the course of illness. Um, and these are concepts which we have gathered together uh, because these are of interest to um, outcomes uh, in COVID research. And uh, so what we have done uh, here, for example, if you look at severe illness, uh, that's a concept which is of interest to know, uh, for example, what pre-morbid conditions might be related to severe illness. And to derive this uh, concept, severe illness, uh, we have gathered under it existing LOINC and RX norm codes, uh, which point to someone having a severe illness and probably is undergoing mechanical ventilation in the ICU. In addition, we also have added a derived term, which here is called severe illness derived. And the idea here is that uh, if uh, you have data on a current patient, and usually uh, patients who are in the hospital currently uh, they may not yet have codes attached to the data. Usually the coding happens at the end of the visit. So you can, uh, when you're doing the ETL, um, map your data uh, to this particular concept, which is the derived term. And after the patient gets discharged, then the codes which um, are applied to that visit will automatically uh, come in and uh, they will also get gathered under the severe illness concept. So this is one uh, important thing that we've done, which makes it easier to uh, query on COVID related terms of interest, like uh, uh, course of illness concepts. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so this basically uh, lists the derived terms that exist in the COVID ontology. So the COVID ontology has got probably close to a thousand terms at this point, and the bulk of them are uh, codes coming from the standard terminologies like LOINC and ICD and uh, CPT. Um, we have the small number of derived terms, and uh, this slide uh, shows you the derived terms. So of particular interest are the, uh, the lab-related derived terms and any site which comes on to the network, this is one of the areas we ask them to focus their mapping uh, activities uh, because this is going to require some extra mapping and these eight values are of particular importance um, to focus on. And then in addition, on the right side, you can see uh, we have these illness severity concepts and there are eight um, derived terms which are associated with them. And so that's kind of the second uh, priority uh, that we have the sites work on to map their uh, data to. Uh, next slide, please. 
And uh, so we also maintain, uh, at least for the test net network at this point, uh, a, a list of derived terms, uh, which we prioritize. And the reason is uh, it, it could take quite a bit of effort for a site to map the data to these derived terms compared to the coded terms, which uh, often uh, just flow through the EHR. And so um, instead of overwhelming a site with hundreds of derived terms, we have listed all the derived terms of interest and we prioritize them and have the sites, especially on the test network at this point, to map to maybe a handful of these terms uh, to start off with. And so in the previous slide, you saw that uh, there are the eight derived terms for the labs and eight derived terms for the illness severity. And those are the two uh, sets of codes that we currently are focused on. And we also have the spreadsheet that you see on this slide, uh, which has a much longer list. And we're currently focused on the first uh, 11 of these. Uh, next slide, please. And so I think that's, yeah, pretty much covers um, the ontology work that we have been doing. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, one of the challenges with the ontology is um, as we expand it out to the network is that we have been releasing this ontology pretty frequently. We are on our third release at this point in the past uh, six to eight weeks. And uh, because of the nature of the evolving terms, especially the long terms, um, we are going to be having um, quite frequent releases of the ontology. Thanks. Thanks, John. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things to address now is uh, when we create this uh, COVID-19 test network, uh, what was the goal? Um, was the goal that we enabled them find query to be done to kind of look at where research might be feasible? And the answer is absolutely. But um, the bottom line is that we have a lot of uh, really amazing data contained within the ACK network that just kind of needs to get let out and used in certain kinds of situations where we can actually do research using the data. That is, and some of it's very detailed. It's things like two by two um, uh, uh, confusion matrices, Cox regression, Poisson regression, and so forth. And so how do we accommodate that in a distributed network like this? So that's the question that uh, we're going to start to answer uh, today and think about you know, how we can make this one of the ways that we can really leverage the network, mostly based on what really would be purely voluntary effort from the different sites who want to be involved in specific research. So we enable the network with this ontology that Sham just showed you to be able to do queries to find where patients are that are um, involved with in, in COVID-19. But then that also allows us to understand, you know, at a basic level, you know, what the various kinds of relationships are between those patients and in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that can support research, really drill into some of the local data. So we wanted to create this ACT COVID-19 find portal that allows general institutional use with proper agreements in place, where patient cohorts can be studied using trial query, but then outcomes measured and novel questions asked to enable the efficient and collaborative use of EHR data, answering specific scientific questions arising throughout the pandemic. Um, using data of proven accuracy. And accuracy is something that really needs to be determined at the local sites. And so we'll look at that a little bit in the next few hours. And then finally, the use of the ACT COVID-19 Shrine Portal to perform feasibility assessments to guide clinical trials as we've been doing for years. Next slide. So, the first thing we had to do when we tried to stand up a network that was going to actually be able to answer questions about COVID was um, make sure that it could actually figure out if the patients had been tested for COVID and if their COVID tests were positive or negative. Now, that sounds like an easy proposition, but in fact, 
Um, there are many, many different ways that laboratory report the results of a COVID positive test or a COVID negative test as text addendums to the test result. So there's not like a standard, you know, uh, uh, POS and NEG. Um, instead, there's a positive, presumably positive uh, 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 test uh, uh, found. Um, you can see some of the other things uh, in, in this slide where a lot of different kinds of text results were entered in the test. And so it didn't really um, uh, let a query be uh, uh, formulated in uh, across the network, which was standardized, which was consistent. So what we'd have to do in order to get that standardized, consistent uh, positive and negative test result uh, reported out in uh, each ACT site was to um, create a derived fact. That is, a group has to go in, they kind of formulate a uh, query, an SQL query, that creates new facts based upon the particularities of their own local coded uh, results to create this generic coded result, which now is gonna be uniform across all the ACT sites. So the next slide shows the result of an enormous amount of work that's done at the site which is to collect all those different terms which are being used to report a positive test result and make them into a single fact per patient. So we call this a derived fact. And you can see now it becomes a queryable data element in the uh, ACT ontology. And populating the ACT ontology, the way that Sean just went to some into some detail with these derived facts turns out to be the key to be able to performing research using the ACT network. So on the next slide, um, creating both positive and negative facts, next slide. We also can aggregate those facts into things that are even simpler to use. For example, any positive lab test or any negative lab test, next slide. And once we have these kind of meta concepts, right? These meta derived facts, now we can ask questions like, um, who is it that's becoming reinfected with COVID? So they have, they're, they have a COVID positive test, 21 days go by, now you have a COVID negative test, and then 30 days go by, and now you have a COVID positive test again. So this is a way that we could discover patients who have been reinfected with COVID, if such a thing actually exists. And because that work was done to make that very concise derived fact, which represented when the test was done and whether it was positive or negative. And it's done in a uniform way, which is expressed, you can see in the yellow box by this ACT ontology item. So that's the path of the ontology item, which is the way that we uniquely can find that uh, derived fact in the database. Now what we can do is we can write a query like this, which is gonna be able to discover this exact pattern of use. And folks can run it in their local databases and participate in the research. And this participation in the research is gonna be key because many times it's not gonna be this simple. It's gonna be different ways you have to create the derived facts, different ways you might need to modify the query, but participating in the research means now you're part of the team and that being part of that research team means publications and um, uh, ways that we can really contribute to this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Next slide. So the ACT team, because we uh, uh, wanted to enable basically the sites and want to enable the sites to be able to do this kind of research and do this kind of uh, a depth analysis, in-depth analysis of our COVID-19 patients, created the any positive lab and any negative lab test, which represents the uh, PCR result. Um, the Sham advanced the ontology a little bit since this slide. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, he and Michelle Morris, I should say, have been absolutely amazing. And Philip Trafet has been the one to back them up and it's been incredible, right? So they've done an incredible job churning out some of these uh, ontologies in, in, in weeks, which, you know, normally it, it just takes months and months to do, and they've gone through many versions and, and really, really amazing. Um, 
they've created this ontology, for example, now up here, which represents uh, respiratory uh, illness, right? So, and, and the severity of respiratory illness can be measured by, you know, whether somebody's on ECMO, whether somebody's been intubated, whether somebody has mechanical ventilation or is on supplemental oxygen. So you can use those different kinds of uh, ontology elements now to query if your patient is having a severe reaction to COVID-19 is in real trouble, as well, of course, as whether they have deceased or not. Next slide. And you can start to ask really important questions, uh, given now the extent that that ontology is developed. So we can ask things like, okay, so were you COVID-19 positive? and then uh, died or were intubated, in other words, had severe disease. And what were the different medications and conditions that you had when you came into the hospital that may have predisposed you to this severe reaction to COVID-19? Or if you're on oxygen, supplemental oxygen, which again, uh, uh, Sham and Michelle put in their vocabularies, um, what is the PO2 level, which is a lab, right, that led to the intubation and might have been followed by a, a, a bad outcome like that. Or a query like if you have you were negative uh, for, for a couple of days and then became positive, what was going on with that test? Are there certain traits of those patients that affected the sensitivity of uh, and specificity of that test? And then finally, let's say we want to ask about gender. So it's it, it, it's it's been seen that males actually get. Uh, the, a more severe reaction to COVID than, than, than females. And why is that, right? And is it that um, they are, and, and how is that actually influencing the course of their disease? In other words, what's the timing and prevalence of these worsening, these, these indicators of severe disease based on their gender? So kind of an observational way that you can uh, tease out, you know, perhaps where you should be looking for uh, instigators of, um, of, of how gender is affecting. Is it a hormonal balance? Is it some kind of behavioral change? Or who knows, right? Um, so here we have um, uh, some important questions that we might be able to ask on COVID-19 based upon the ontologies that have been developed um, and, the, and the capability to do research in the local sites. Next slide. So here we have a uh, now a highly dynamic system to ask new questions. It respects patient privacy and institutional privacy with distributed queries that are that only compile aggregate results, perhaps to see where studies are feasible, and then local data expertise and and work can be used to build facts guided by the ontology item definitions. We can validate the data, and we'll go into some detail about how that uh, is is occurring um, in the next uh, presentation. Uh, based upon the fact that we have folks at the local sites who can uh, really look into the chart and look into various uh, very specific uh, items in the local sites to confirm whether the definitions that we've come up with kind of, you know, let's just say off the top of our heads is really being borne out by the true course of the patient that you see in the chart. And then finally, being able to translate this directly to data that can be leveraged for clinical trials. Next slide. So we have this course of a future research pipeline for ACT, such that we could study COVID-19 or any other disease in teams, right? So various teams can go in and study various aspects of diseases by using this pattern of creating an ontology and then working through quality, making new derived facts, performing local analytics based on those facts, doing data validation, pooling the results together, and finally resulting in a publication. Next slide. So that's kind of the new plan for how we can be doing research in, in ACT. And we'll go into a little bit more depth in the next uh, presentation next week. And now we'll turn it over to Doug, who I believe will talk soon. Yeah, I'm going the talk. wrong way here though. Here we go. All right, thank you. So a little bit more detail about um, our plans for production rollout of this, as you've seen, um, a lot of effort has gone into uh, designing the ontology and thinking about the ways that people are going to query this and, and the valuable information that can come out of this. And we've done some very effective testing of that in our test network. Um, and uh, so our production rollout 
is um, happening starting Monday. And the, the really big advantage of this, of course, is while we had 30 million lives in the, the sites across our test network, we have 130 million lives in our production network. And it's open for any researcher at those uh, 40 some odd to 50 institutions to, to work with. So um, we started out uh, on the test network, uh, working there basically from March until May. We're still working there for some of the iterations. Um, we have started uh, with some sites to use the stage network for their local testing. And some of them like to do that before um, they take a, a production release. And then starting next Monday and through July, we'll be doing the production release here. Um, so right, starting Monday, 6.15, um, the ball gets rolling. Uh, they use the, um, and now it's, it's officially released, right, Sham, the 3.0 for, uh, for use? Yeah, I think it's uh, um, officially been deployed on the test network and it's officially released. Uh, there might be a few things that people might report that for which we might uh, issue some patches. Cool. Yeah. I mean, one of the cool things about the way we structure this release process is we can just do it over and over again and when we need to. Um, of course, just taking the ontology is not the whole thing. You need to, as Sean and Sham had mentioned, there's derived terms and new terminology. We'll need to do some mapping there. Um, we've tried to confine that to um, things that aren't ex exceedingly challenging, but uh, nonetheless, there'll be some changes probably to ETL there. Um, we're gonna be asking sites to try to increase their data refresh rates on the production network. Um, and ideally we'd like something like weekly, um, but we'll be working with every site to sort of understand what their limitations are and um, you know, sort of get a better understanding of how uh, data refresh rates are gonna look you know, as we go through the summer. Um, there will be an update to the latest version of I2B2, 12A. Um, that's part of the process. Uh, update to Shrine, to our version 3.0 release of Shrine, which includes a new interface, and you're going to be seeing a lot about that today. And of course, the network operation team, um, which is, uh, you know, Elena and I sort of oversee, and Mark Ciriello here at Harvard um, is, you know, on the ground with a lot of our team members, uh, will be engaged in sort of managing the release process and answering uh, general questions regarding, you know, issues with doing an installation or something like that and collecting information from sites about data refresh rates and progress. Um, all right, so that was the quick version of the production rollout. I think, yeah, we are done with slides here. Um, so I think we have some Q&A time. Is that... Um, we do, yes, we have about five minutes for Q&A and then we'll take a five minute break before we start our second session at the top of the hour. Okay, cool. Elena, there's a question there about, is the ACT production network still not open to the general public? So the short answer is uh, correct. It is not open to the general public. Um, there are, um, you know, there are, have been expressed some concerns regarding, um, you know, behavior on the network that would be uh, problematic. People um, trying to re-identify individuals or looking at sensitive uh, procedures, you know, like abortions or something like that. Um, and so um, we have restricted the use for this to be um, just researchers at participating sites. So. Uh, also following a principle that, you know, you have to contribute data for your researchers to um, access the network as a whole. Um, and of course, our whole data steward concept is involved with um, each of the sites within the network having a data steward. Um, so the, correct, the general public does not have access now. We've heard a lot of requests for this. Um, and we're looking through scenarios where um, we might be able to do that um, it would require putting a fair number of limitations into the system, but um, it's certainly something that is feasible. Any other questions?
Okay, it looks like there's one in the list here uh, from Bill Adams. Um, it, I think either Sham or Sean might handle this. All right, there's, there's the chat and there's the Q and A, and I'm all confused. Oh, yeah. There's a, now, yeah, there's a Q and A uh, question. Yeah. Okay. So Bill Adams says, "How do derived facts like severely ill account for events happening separated by time? If multiple co facts contribute, which date is used?" And Bill, that is an excellent question. Um, so I'm going to go into that actually a little bit more in the next uh, uh, session because that's such a, that is a really excellent question. So it turns out that uh, you're absolutely right. So you need to kind of base everything around an index date, so to speak. So what we call this a level two fact, where um, the terms that are simply reflecting things like you know with what when they were billed for the ICU or when they were coded for being on mechanical ventilation, that's perfectly natural, right? And that's just part of our ontology. And so what is being grouped with, um, with Sham and Michelle in those ontology items are really just facts that are occurring ordinarily. Hmm. And then you can kind of group those into, a, in, into one term and add in maybe other uh, indicators you have from Epic or something like that during the ICU. But really it's, it's just a kind of a typical I2B2 fact kind of represented in a new way, and that's called a level one term. But, but your point is great, which is, well, sometimes you're gonna make a fact and it's gonna be surrounding an index date. For example, were they severe after they got COVID-19, right? And within, you know, before their discharge from the hospital. So was it during their hospitalization for COVID-19 that they got uh, severe? And that we call level two fact, it has kind of temporal information embodied in it. It's really good for queries, but it's very specific for a certain kind of study that's being done. So it's a great question. And that's, um, and that, that very much when, when we do research, that's the, that's the considerations we'll have for making these derived facts. The next one from Gilbert Ullman, Sean, are we? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Are we defining, yeah. are we definitely capturing lab and clinical decisions related to acute kidney injury? Um, good question, Gil. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the conventional, you know, creatinine and so forth is gonna be captured, um, but um, it would be good to know what you have in mind um, because I'm sure that uh, there's more we could extract that maybe would be much more relevant and we could make into some derived facts regarding uh, specifically acute ki kidney injury, which is a very, important thing happening in uh, COVID-19 infections. Right, and it is actually included in the ontology just in terms of the diagnosis and stuff. Um, I believe it's one of the severe diagnosis in that, in the course of illness portion of the ontology. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good point, Michelle, very good point. Yeah, um, also in general, all labs are refreshed for this COVID cohort at a higher rate. It's not just the labs that you see in the COVID ontology, but all labs and all diagnosis and all procedures are updated. Right. So I could take the next question, uh, which is from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> Participating hospitals access to the app network must be within BPN of the hospital currently. Um, so I don't think we literally dictate that, but it, it needs to be only accessible by uh, the um, research staff at that institution. Um, of course, the data steward is overlooking that, um, but uh, we, uh, we would frown on someone implementing their uh, web client access in a way that the public could get to it. And we're just inviting you know, more of a hacker kind of uh, risk. So um, I believe that the scenario you're describing there is the scenario at most, if not all, existing uh, production sites. And let's answer the last question here, and then we will break for our next session. Yes, yes. Da David has a great question, which is uh, regarding David data update frequency. He realized that everyone likes fresh data, but it, is there a reason that weekly or twice weekly was chosen versus monthly? At first, he says the need for weekly data updates might be. Uh, necessary, but now it isn't clear. And is there an expectation the data might be used for some type of surveillance? So 
really good question. Um, I'll take half the question, I guess, which is clearly at the uh, onset of, of our COVID-19 crisis, there was very little in the databases um, on COVID-19, especially because a lot of data takes a, a, a month or two sometimes to reach um, fruition inside the databases. So we had to make kind of a special effort to get that, make sure that some of that data was in there in a timely fashion so we could answer some of these questions. Um, I'm not sure about surveillance though, in terms of, I mean, we certainly wanna know what data is in there and available for research, um, but surveillance, maybe Doug, uh, you, can, you can answer that one. Um, sure. So, I mean, I don't think I've heard that of ACT being used officially for surveillance, but with higher refresh rates, you can see things like, you know, changes in tests, you know, every couple of days, which I think is, is interesting and potentially valuable. You can also uh, observe um, sort of the course of patients a little bit more granularly um, and uh, see whether... Um, you know, the rates of people sort of uh, going into different kinds of severities and so on. Um, yeah, so of course the original interpretation was, you know, COVID-19 is changing rapidly and uh, we need to get frequent data on it. Um, and, you know, we clearly in this case, um, over time, we may decide that uh, weekly is providing us relatively little value. Um, but um, right now our goal is to try to get sites to weekly. And that will be valuable, of course, when the next thing comes up, not just COVID-19. Uh, again, we will wanna see you know, early signals um, that are evolving within the health record. Well, thank you, Doug, Sean, Shalm. This was excellent.